on May 17th. We are still in a virtual meeting, so we will still follow the same process and rhythm that we've had in the past. Tonight, we have the uh, meeting of the minutes. We have the public safety and fire station two uh, agenda item. We have the Sunita Williams, and then we have a presentation, um, which a broader part of the community will be attending as well on the toward net zero buildings. Um, we do have invoices for the public safety, Sunita Williams, Memorial Park, and Central Ave. I would like to try and do that before we do the, the, the net zero so we can just close out after that. Um, with that said, I will go to the first agenda item. Um, we will have roll calls as usual. Um, for the approved minutes, do I hear a motion to approve the last meeting minutes? Motion to approve. Second. Second. <clears throat> Thank you, Richard. And any questions? No questions, seeing none, hearing none, coming to the vote, roll call. Richard. Aye. George. Aye. Roy. Aye. Irwin. Aye. There is aye. Okay. All right, we will now move to the public safety, which we will then need to get the chiefs and anybody else that's sitting in the, uh, got Chief Schlittler, is Chief Condon in too? Yep, Chief Condon's in. Anybody else that is going to be needed? Ken, anybody else is, that's not here that needs that is needed? Um, I don't know if Miles and Keith are on. Steve? Uh, they're coming in, Ken. Thank you. Okay, let's wait until they get in. I can't, I can't see them, I've already. Yeah, you loaded up the uh, <clears throat> image. They're on the side, I think. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can only see four or five at a time, so. There is a, can you get Gene in, please? Oh, sure. Sorry, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, Ken, turn it over to you. And I can't get the blue. Can't get the blue off. It doesn't want to play with me. So. It was off for a minute ago. It, it, yeah, I touch the screen. It goes off, and then it just stays there. So whatever. We can. Okay. Call. If everybody's okay with that. I think people can. Move it's on. readable. Yeah, it's um, very readable. All right. All right. On the uh, on the schedule. Uh, on phase two, the police side over at headquarters, uh, the main level deck uh, was poured a couple weeks ago and they poured the upper level deck today. Uh, we've got uh, CMU uh, block going in on stair four and the uh, detention area uh, in and around the uh, uh, Sally port. Site utilities are ongoing. They're out in the street today doing the water line. And they got the underslab utilities that I think are now done. Can people go on mute, please? Um, they, uh, the drains just came in. And uh, while I'm talking about the drains, something I just wanted to mention, while we're still on schedule, uh, there's a lot of uh, material problems, as you probably have, have read and heard in the news, um, not only from a pricing standpoint, but from an availability standpoint. Uh, we're closely monitoring our subcontractors. Uh, stainless steel especially is an issue and we have concerns with those items that need to be uh, measured in the field. You can't order them until you can measure it in the field and things like the, uh, the one thing that jumps to mind is the crash rail throughout uh, the police and, and fire station too. Uh, we may have issues with that because stainless steel is an item that we've been told is a very long delivery time. Thankfully, most of the subs have ordered most of their materials. Um, but uh, for instance, the, um, the drains that just went into the Sally Port area today uh, had a very long lead time. They were supposed to have been in over a month ago and uh, they just came in uh, last Thursday. So we'll continue to monitor that. Hopefully we won't have any issues right now. We're on schedule, but uh, that's something we'll continue to keep you updated on. 
Over at Fire Station 2, the brickwork is just about done. Uh, some odds and ends left to do. I don't know, Mike, did they get the rest of it washed down? Okay. Uh, uh, no, the wash down will start tomorrow. Got it. So then they'll get that squared away on the uh, on the back the back half of that building area and around the side, and then what they have to do in the front. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, continue to work on the MEP work. Uh, Sheetrock's underway on both the upper level and the middle level. It's a started taping, uh, so we're moving along pretty well with that. We're going um, to start on painting. Um, so like I said, we're, uh, we're still on schedule, uh, looking for fire station in October, October, November, October, November and, uh, police, uh, January, February of next year. Any questions with the schedule? Okay. The ACL, a lot of stuff came off this month. You'll see when we talk about the change order, um, the one big item that's on here still is a temporary facility restoration. We're winding that down in terms of pricing. That number might tick down a little bit, but that's pretty close to, to where we're gonna be. Uh, and in all likelihood, you'll see that uh, CR next month in the change order. Uh, the rest of the stuff on there is, is fairly minimal. Just an overflow drain is the largest uh, remaining item. That's about 8,600 bucks an overflow drain at fire station two that need to be relocated. Um, so we have any questions on the ACL? Yeah, I'm, I might as well um, jump in and just let everybody know, and I'm sure everybody's aware that the town meeting did pass article 37, which was the revised number of the 1.4 million that we requested for this project to fund the uh, basically contingency to replenish it from the cost due to the soil as well as um, to the COVID costs. And um, I think that was, I think, grateful to see town meeting do that. It now should give Ken and the team the correct budget to be able to go through. I, I'm hoping that we are driving our burn rate down that's what the goal is but we needed that contingency in case anything else came up so i think ken and steve it would be good to make sure that the next meeting we have is just let's do a touch point on where we are against the burn rate and, and where we are but and we can certainly have more of this conversation once we finish up i think the invoices and everything else unless people feel they want to talk about it now but I think with the ACL staying steady, is that a fair statement, Ken? And that- um, Yeah, it's actually, it's, actually going, it's actually going down. Which is good um, because that means, that means hopefully we're, we, our goal is to not use anything and get it back. We still need the due diligence on the change controls and everything else. But I think as we voted as a committee, it was important to make sure that we had the funds to complete the project. So. We should not be going near any of the uh, red flags of, of shutdown by any means. Um, and we'll just go from there. But if I may request Ken and Steve, I think it would make sense for us to do a quick financial overview the next time around well, we see where we are. Because February was kind of that mark. And now if we get to June. We can do it. We can do it real quick right now, Stuart. I mean, last month, uh, if, you, if you recall, we had uh, um, roughly 65000 a month was what we were uh, trying to keep it at or below uh, on the uh, on the change orders. Last month was 55, I believe, if I recall, uh, and that included the COVID number. Uh, this month is 61, including 11,000 in COVID, which was handled separately. So we're really only at about 50. And this month is really almost a month and a half's worth of change orders because we had uh, the last presentation was the beginning of April, and here we are in the middle of May. Uh, so we're, uh, you know, from that, that $65,000 look, if you will, uh, the, the past two months have been, uh, have been well inside of that. And given the current, uh, uh, ACL, which outside of the, um, uh, hillside, the, the, the hillside is you, you can yeah. see, you can see it's, you know, $25,000 or less. So, okay. um, so we're about 65 is what you're saying. Yeah, well, this, this month we're actually at about 50. 
this this 61 is really 50 because you backed the COVID out okay. because that was handled separately. Okay. So, um, so you know, and, and I will I will include that every month. I'll give sort of a an update. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty self explanatory because when you get the, when you get my agenda, just look for the COVID number, take it out, and that will be your you know sort of the monthly uh, change order. Okay. Anybody have any questions relative to that? Mr. Chairman. Richard. Yeah, uh, Ken, just wanted to follow up on your question uh, regarding, or rather your comment regarding the um, temporary facility restoration. Do I take from your comment that there's been some sort of a meeting of the minds as to what exactly temporary facility restoration means? I know that's been an open question for some time now. We, we still, Richard, we still don't have the, uh, um, I'll just call it the, the, the planning board piece. Um, Steve, I, I forget when we're on the agenda for that, but this number does not include any cost to put it back with the, the bus islands or the, the mm -hmm. traffic directions that, that were there originally. Right. This just, you know, gets the, gets the tent and the, uh, uh, the trailers out of the way and disconnected mm -hmm. and the remaining area paved so it can be used uh going forward but if uh planning deigns to say oh no you got to put it back the way it was that's going to be about uh, another hundred and twenty thousand dollars okay thank you appreciate it we are uh, just to interject where um i've been told that we're on the agenda for the uh, first of june with okay. planning board to uh get a uh the amendment uh, to the site plan uh, special permit, which uh, would allow us to follow the plan that's identified by the 373. Which essentially does what we were planning to do, Steve? Correct. It's, and no more. It's to do what is identified by the 373 in the ACL. Okay. Do you, do you expect any additional push by them to make it more than that? Especially <laughs> since we don't know what that building is gonna be used for? I haven't heard any uh, word. It's a little difficult in town um, we don't have planning in residence at PSAP. Um, I have heard no negative feedback and the presentation is being done by the uh, town council. Okay. Okay. All right. There's no yeah. more questions. If there are no more questions, yeah, we can move right to the, uh, the, the voting items. Stuart. Okay, so we're going to do the change order first, correct? We can do that. Okay, so we have a couple of packets here. Um, first is the change order, change order number 28. You can see on the screen for $61,352, which is coming out of the general contracting budget. And that is CO28. Any, do I hear a motion? Do I hear a Motion. <laughs> I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Roy. Um, any questions on the change order? Hearing none, seeing none, coming to a vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chief Schlittler? Aye. Great. Okay. Next uh, invoice is the, I'm going to, for, sorry, the next one is an invoice, which is consigli for requisition number 28 through April 2021 for $1,909,697.40 coming out of the general contracting budget. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Richard. Any questions? Hearing none, coming to the vote. 
Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chief Schlittler? Aye. Okay, I am going to put forth the invoice for Castle Booze, April 2021 services coming out of the architecture budget. $26,430.80. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? Seeing none, hearing none. Coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. George, excuse me, Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chief Schlittler? Aye. Chair's eye. Okay, I am going to do one more and then I'm gonna put a group of them together. Next invoices for uh, GALS, it's the containment system coming out of the FF and E. I do have a question. $3,069.60, do I hear a second? Second. Just question containment system coming out of FF and E. It, it's, yeah, well, it's, owner, it's on the owner's equipment line. Catherine lumped those together, but if you look at the budget, there are two. There's an FF and E, and then there's an owner's equipment. And this comes That's out of the owner's equipment. equipment line. Okay. Any other questions? Any none coming to the vote? Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chief Schlittler? Aye. Chair is aye. Okay. Now there's, uh, let's see, three, six, approximately 10 invoices here, if not more. I'm gonna go through them in one fell swoop. They're all coming out of miscellaneous budget. First one is Motorola Communications Tower final invoice, $100,856.40. Pods, we've been seeing this on a regular basis. So these, this pod is for the $114.99. There's a second pod for $114.99, different location. And then there's a Milton Cat invoice, generator rental for May, 2021 for $2,612.50. We have a Needham Police Detail for $1,008. We have UTS of Mass, April, Mass, excuse me, March, April materials testing on Chestnut Street for $855. We have a UTS of Mass, March and April materials testing for Fire Station 2 for $340. We have a UTS of Mass, April materials testing on Fire Station 2 for $720. We have an invoice for Wrist Frost Shumway, April commissioning services for the, the PSC, that's the complex, $2,080. And we have a final invoice for wrist frost shumway, shum, shumway, I don't know why I'm saying it differently. April commissioning services for fire station two for $1,768. Do I hear a second? Second. Any questions? I have one. Um, Hi, George. How can we be finished with commissioning the fire station two when we haven't tested it? Uh, ventilation systems, et cetera. It, there's, a, there's an acceptance phase, George. That, that, so that closes out the construction phase, I believe, but there's an acceptance phase that covers all of those items. Okay, so this just covers through the construction of the building. Correct. Okay, got it. I just have a clarifying question because there's two invoices for fire station two for UTS of mass. Um, one is for March, April, and the other one's for April. I mean, is it just? It, it, the way, the way it's, it's probably just the way they bill, Stuart. I, 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 I can't say. It's not a double billing or anything like that. No, no it's, not, it's not a double billing. They're just, uh, they the just March, April the had some March dates and April dates, and then the April one okay. just had April dates. It's the Correct. finishing up of April. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I just, they're I billing that a little bit to be desired. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none, seeing none coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. 
Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chief Condon? Aye. Chief Schlittler? Aye. Chair is aye. Okay, that is it for public safety invoices and voting items. Anything else, Ken? No, sir. Okay. With that, we will close out the Public Safety Complex and Fire Station 2 agenda item, and we will go to Sunita Williams. So thank you to the user group and the architects and the construction guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, folks. Have a good Bye. night. All right. So let's go to Sunita Williams. Is that going to be you, Hank? Uh, yes. And uh, Steve Gentile, I don't know if uh, Michael Kaskak is in the audience if you could elevate him please <clears throat> he's not he's not in the waiting room hank okay all right um i forwarded on friday a um, letter and a final audit that we received from the msba um and uh we've gone through our preliminary review um it seems to be in order um, they have uh, found every single excuse not to um, <laughs> to reimburse things, um, but they are, um, as spelled out in the project funding agreement, there are a series of caps um, that the project has in terms of site development costs, in terms of unit cost per square foot, in terms of the maximum um, FF&E and technology budgets. And so in their final uh, reckoning on the uh, pages, they've listed all of the ineligible costs uh, and um, they're listed in great detail on pages five, six, and seven. <clears throat> and then, um, and then the uh, change orders, um, are that are listed on on pages uh, eight and nine are consistent with the most uh, recent uh, agreement on um, eligible change orders. Um, so the the grand total uh, of the um, proposed uh, final settlement is for six hundred and fifty two thousand nine hundred and. $72 uh, that was withheld. And that is a little over 5% of what the total reimbursement is. Uh, total facilities grant, which is uh, listed on page three, is $12,715,234. Um, and even though the um, agreed upon um, rate of reimbursement was 34.72 because of all those various caps. Um, the actual was a little, um, if, if we back out the land costs, uh, the actual reimbursement was in the 25 to 26% range. Um, so it's, uh, it's a good chunk of change. Um, and assuming the um, this is agreeable to the committee, um, then it would need to be signed off by the town manager. Um, uh, Stuart, you as the chair and um, and the superintendent. <clears throat> and it would um, we need to do that within the next 10 days. Um, get the signed copy back to them and in order to get it on to the uh, board meeting in uh, on the 24th of June. Are there any questions about the? Yeah, is there a recourse on what they're withholding? We have an ability to go back and, and have a discussion of why or our basis or is that a one and only? We, we don't really have any objection, I think, to what they have come up with, Stuart. Um, 
the ability is constrains the closure of the any comments going back um, would delay the board vote and the closure of the audit and the reimbursement. But beyond that, we, Hank, am I correct that we don't really, we don't see any issue with really what they've come up with? That's correct. Because you opened up, you opened up, Hank, with they did everything that they could to do it, which is we kind of know that's their job is right. That, but but yeah. you put it into a context that I said made me think of that is there really an agreement that we're okay with it? Which I know you're saying that, Steve, and now you're saying that, Hank, but it strikes me as 652000 is a lot of money that, that if we really believe that should be reimbursed, you know, by delaying by one board vote, are we cost, is there a greater cost to try and get a 652? Or are we are only arguing about ten or $20,000 within the 652? Then I agree. It's, there's, there's a trade-off of time and effort. Yeah, I mean, we if we agree to this, there will be six hundred and fifty-two thousand dollars coming, coming to the town. It'll probably take them a couple months to pay that amount. But um, maybe you remember the process. Once we got to ninety-five percent completion, um, they started withholding reimbursements to the town, and so that's been. They, they've uh, withheld those reimbursements, gosh, I, I think it was close to the end of construction. And um, uh, while they go through, while they went through the final audit, the final audit was delayed a little bit because of COVID, I would say at least one board cycle. Um, and in reviewing these numbers, um, maybe I was being too facetious on my introduction but um, I did go through the, the footnotes are really key on, on the charts. And so they do have these allowances and scope exclusion limits and so on and so forth that we have known all along. Um, we just didn't have the final uh, math on it until, until now. Yeah, so let me, let, hold on a second, because so, I, may be, I may have gone a different direction, sorry. 62 is coming back to us. Is there anything within the final audit that we disagree with that we should be getting more money for? I, no, I mean, there may okay. be. All right, that's, that's small that, numbers. That, sorry, that was my fault for, I, I got the impression that there was more on the table that we're just succumbing to, but if we're not, then I have, I have no objection. My question's withdrawn. I, I mean, I think more, more importantly, um, there's, they, they do have these limits. I think we were aware of them all the way along. And, um, I, I would say that it's simply a matter, it was simply a matter of them determining where we, um, uh, exceeded that limit and they couldn't pay us more by the rules of the game. Uh, I, I, I as I recall, there aren't any issues that we're fighting over here. Um, I think we, we've known about all of these all the way along, I think. Yeah. Isn't that, cor isn't that correct, Hank? That, that's correct. And yeah. so essentially this is the final payment. They stopped paying us at a, as of a certain date. And then they essentially they just say, okay, whatever charges are from here on out, we're going to audit the whole thing and we'll pay you what we think we owe you out of the rest of the project. And essentially, that's what they've done, and that's what the six hundred and fifty-two thousand is. That the numbers, uh, Hank? 652. Yeah, six fifty-two. Six fifty-two um, and some change. Well, and nine hundred and seventy-two, so almost sixty uh, six hundred and fifty-three thousand. Right. So there, but there aren't any major issues that we're 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 arguing with them about, uh, as, right. I, as I read it anyway. So that, okay. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. So in other words, if we were on the other side, if we were on their side trying to figure this out, we probably would come to the same conclusions based on the rules that they previously established. Correct. We, we may not agree with them, but those are the rules of the game that we're playing, <laughs> essentially. 
yeah. we don't have much choice. And, um, and I, I, we agreed have... those rules uh, at the onset when we signed the. That's right. Uh, signed up for this. Um, yeah, I and... did have one question though, and that is um, the. Um, uh, how should I phrase this? Uh, the. Um, Why don't you come back to me? I'll, I'll okay. think about any how to other, rephrase Any it. other questions before George remembers this question? And I, then I think, Hank, what you're looking for is a vote, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. George, yeah. do you have your question or would you like to put a motion forth? Um, I'll put a motion forth that we accept the, the um, audited 652,900 and change. 72. 72. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Richard. Any questions? Hearing none, seeing none, coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chair is aye. I don't see a user community member here. Uh, I think no. we're okay. Okay? Yep. All right, great. Hank, anything else? Uh, there is, um, Catherine, there's one invoice, is there? I have it right here. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's actually 26 small invoices, but I've lumped them together. It's Great. the same vendor. Okay, so I'll put forth the invoice for Konica Minolta, 26 printers delivered August, 2019. It's coming out of the technology budget for, ooh, excuse me, 15,000. $882.18. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Roy. Any questions? Are these part of the original budgeted amount? Yes. Uh, and how come we're getting them so late? I guess I, I'm confused. <laughs> They're very disorganized. And I, I've been trying for 18 months to get them to send me an invoice. So these printers were delivered a long time ago. Yeah, they, they were delivered they, 2019. They, they didn't bill us until now. There, Correct. There were there were there were two or three that were non-functioning. And so the school department send them back, they got replacements, and they uh, they didn't bill any of any of them. They could have billed us for, I don't know, the majority of them, but they chose not to. Okay. So is this the last? bill that we have to pay? Likely. Um, the only other outstanding um, item is borrowing costs of, of the encumbrances. And um, Dave Davidson uh, didn't want to commit on how much additional costs there would be until he knew exactly what the reimbursement would be. Uh, from the MSBA, um, so that, um, but that's already encumbered, and I'm not sure that you will need to vote on it. Um, but just be aware that there's about 128,000 out there on on borrowing costs. I I would not expect them to utilize um, all all of that. To date, I think Catherine, he's only used. 5,000. It's a very small amount. Yeah. So um, the balance, uh, as you know, we, we've already uh, rescinded uh, 10 million on the project and we have over 450,000 still um, in the budget. And once this settlement is done and once uh, Dave Davison closes out the borrowing, <clears throat> then we should be able to rescind the balance. Okay, any other questions? Okay. There are none seen them. We will come to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Gene? Aye. Chair is aye. Erwin? Aye. 
Thank you. All right. That's it. Okay. And I don't see another invoice for Sunita. So we're all set for that, Hank? Correct. Okay. Great. Um, then thank you. That handles the uh, Sunita. Now we have a two sets of invoices. We can handle that before we go to the next major topic on the agenda. Uh, we've got a Memorial Park Fieldhouse invoice for environments at work, shelving tables and chairs coming on the miscellaneous budget for $5,211.27. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, George. Any questions? My, uh, my favorite question. Are, are we just about done, Hank? Uh, Mike? Mike. Yes. The end I mean, Yes. What, is that, what does that mean? That means we're done. I don't have anything else. So, so we, we, can, we can tally up the totals and rescind whatever is left, how little, however little it is. Yep, I got, uh, I got an invoice for uh, Signet, and that's it once they bill us. But that's, we're done. Signet's the alarm system here. Right. So, so I would assume we'll see some kind of a, of a uh, item in the, in the agenda in the future to rescind it and end the project for us. Yep, we could do that. But not before we get the final invoice from Signet, Mike. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, right. Which, which I'm hoping to have uh, this month or beginning of next month. So, so George, you might get a present in June. It would be fine. I like those. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Hearing none, seeing none coming to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chair is aye. We all set on that one, Catherine? Yes, we are. Okay. Last two invoices relative to the Jack Cogswell storage building. Two invoices coming out of the miscellaneous budget. First invoice is MECO Environmental or METCO uh, Environmental Tight Tank Inspection, $2,555. And ENE Systems for BMS Installation, Building Management System Installation, that's $1,500. Those two invoices together, do I hear a second? Seconded. Thank you, George. Any questions? Hearing none, seeing none. Yep, oh, George, no? Well, I, I I have the same question there. Have we finished everything that's still on the agenda for that building? I know we were putting some things in for, for uh, further use of the building. Um, well, George, we, that, that issue wraps around the the solar issue and whether or not oh okay yeah. got it okay all so right it, i guess i guess in that respect what do we plan to do uh just leave the, leave it open until we make that decision a recommendation we should yes we okay. i think i i think George, we we have to start having that discussion again in terms of the solar and the next move on that based on where we were a couple months back with the thing that was signed. Um, and obviously Steve Gentile's got that background. So is that correct? Yes. Um, Steve the, and Hank. Hank as well. Um, we've signed the interconnection services agreement and we're uh, gathering consensus and um, We'll proceed uh, in a couple of months with the next step. Yeah. We have, we have, George, I think for everybody's benefit, I think we have to have some uh, discussions with the powers to be in the town um, to decide how they want to go forward based on the economics that have been put forth. So I think there's consensus building in that. that. And until that's done, I don't think we can really close out, George. Okay. Okay. All right. With that, I don't see any other questions. Hearing none, come to the vote. Richard? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Gene? Aye. Chair is aye. I see that is the final set of invoices, Catherine. Do we declare victory in invoices tonight? Yes, this is true. Great. All right. So that's it for everything except the last agenda item, which is the 
uh, fourth item toward net zero buildings. Um, and I think that, uh, it, are you gonna chair this, Hank, on this discussion? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll okay. start off. Okay, uh, but so, so for everybody's benefit, there is other people that are in the audience that various town uh, representatives and different committees and people of interest. I don't know if we need to bring them into this, Hank, but I'll let you do that. But um, for everybody's benefit, this is gonna be a presentation. I believe you'll make it interactive, Hank, at some point, but I would like everybody to sort of, we get through this presentation from a committee standpoint. And if there's anything else we need to do, once this concludes, we can handle uh, any other uh, PVC business. I don't think there's anything on the agenda other than just confirming the meetings uh, from this day forward. So with that said, I'll turn over to you, Hank, to basically preface and set this discussion up. Yes, I uh, send out an agenda. I'll uh, do an initial introduction. Uh, Natasha will uh, take over from me. And uh, we have a guest speaker. She'll introduce the guest speaker and then Michael Grice will um, wrap things up and uh, look at what the next opportunities are within Needham. Um, Hank, I apologize to interrupt, but it's important. I think with the number of people that are here, um, it is a virtual meeting. I, I just would ask everybody to look at their participant panel. If there's questions that need to come up, the best way is to click on your screen for raise your hand. Um, otherwise, it'll be probably difficult because we don't want to see everybody's faces. So I'll leave it to you, Hank, but I think it was worth mentioning to make sure that we have some civil order in the interaction. Uh, yes, and we, um, uh, I think people can uh, enter any questions into the chat, and then at the conclusion, um, Steve Gentile can help, and, and I know Michael uh, and the, the other uh, speakers will, uh, can address those questions. Um, so Needham has taken steps, significant steps toward sustainable sustainability. It was an important step in 2020, becoming a, a green community. Um, that included the adoption of a stretch energy code. It included a commitment for an energy reduction plan to achieve 20% energy savings within the first five years. Um, it included uh, purchasing only fuel efficient vehicles where commercially available and practical. And it also offered, in certain areas, um, uh, as of right, uh, siting of renewable energy sources. The Sinita Williams School, which you are very aware of, um, achieved a LEED Silver rating. Um, it does have a uh, full solar array on the rooftop, and that produces um, over 20% over 27% of the electrical demand for that building. Um, and it saves annually about $40,000 in electricity and is also creating smart payments of about $20,000 a year. Um, while it is the most efficient building within um, Needham, public buildings, uh, it, it was not designed for and did not achieve net zero status. The other building um, of note is the Public Services Administration building. It has an, it's an all electric building. There's no uh, greenhouse gas emission coming from that building. As you may recall, it has ground source heat pumps that serve both the heating and cooling of that building. And electrification of all building systems is an important step toward achieving net zero. So there is um, one building in town that is heading in that direction. And, uh, and if the solar panels uh, could be put on that roof uh, or were put on that roof, that would help to get it toward net zero. And then of course, um, there is a large solar array at the RTS that 3.59 megawatt um, installation, 
produces between three and four million kilowatt hours of clean renewable energy each year. And again, that's about a quarter of the total demand uh, for the town's public buildings. Um, I think the, um, the estimate that we started off with when, when that project was being done, thanks to the Solar Energy Exploratory Committee, um, we far exceeded the uh, return on that investment. There's about $50,000 a year in lease, about $100,000 a year in taxes on the asset, and in net metering, the town achieves um, uh, about $700,000 of net metering benefit for a total of about $850,000 per year coming back in. And that money goes into the energy fund. But I think the question I'd like to raise tonight is should the town reinvest some of this income into future municipal renewable energy projects? Um, so we can think about that and discuss it later. With that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Natasha. I think all of you know Natasha. You recently uh, elected member of the planning board and a former member of the uh, of this committee. So Natasha, floor is you. Before you go to Natasha, I just want to remind everybody with your statement this committee, the PBC, is not putting anything to vote relative to the town. I think this meeting has become an open meeting beyond PVC to focus on the net zero. So I just want to clarify that this committee is not sponsoring something per se other than this dialogue. And I think it's a very important dialogue and something that as a town we should be doing. We've taken a strong approach within the PVC and the buildings that we build uh, to be very conscious relative to this. But I think it's fair to say, unless you feel otherwise, Hank, it's, it's not really PVC that's putting it into, in, into motion here to, to vote for that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that you, you asked to, uh, the committee asked to learn more about what net zero was. The discussion has been going on both nationally and statewide um, about net zero and greenhouse gases and climate action. So this is uh, really an opportunity to educate us and um, to learn more. Great, thank you. Natasha? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I still thought I was part of the PPBC, but I just learned today I wasn't. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone just in general um, for, for welcoming me and for letting me be part of this committee for such a long time. I think I started in 2012, so. It's been a pleasure and um, this is really exciting, all of this net zero, but I just wanted to say that to those of you that I haven't reached out personally. Um, so I'm here to introduce Jacob Knowles that I uh, definitely thought that he would be the best person to talk to us about net zero. He's the director of sustainable design at BR Plus A and he leads their sustainability consulting team. Um, he is an expert on, um, on zero net energy and he's worked on millions of square feet of carbon neutral and carbon positive projects, which has received a million awards, including a lot of AIA code top 10 awards, which is really, really um, remarkable. So he also, what I like about Jacob is that he's also an architect. He said he has a bachelor of architecture from RISD and we're currently working together professionally on a new health science building for Mass Bay Community College in Framingham, which is slated to be net zero and on a civic master plan for Somerville, which Jacob is it also slated for net zero for those projects, right? So, um, and they're the house doc, they're one of the house doctors for DCAM for energy, water and climate. So um, I know Jacob really well, not only from working together, but because he was, a, he was, he is a board member of the BSA, the Boston Society for Architecture. And I was the president of the board last year and I'm still sitting on the board with him this year. But we worked on a lot of different initiatives last year that he led or co-led with Andrea Love and Ellen Watts um, and what some of them being the net zero stretch code support letter to the BBRS and the legislature um, with roughly 100 firms and 1500 professional signatures, the zero code um, and easy code, the AIA letters of support for the bill and the municipal climate bill support letter with official signatures from towns and cities representing 40% of the population of the entire state. So um, because of all these credentials and his leadership in net zero, again, I thought he would be amazing. So without further ado, um, I'll have Jacob take over and talk to us about net zero. 
Thanks, Natasha. That was great. I really feel flattered by your intro. Thank you. Um, it's great to meet everybody. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, as Natasha said, you know, I, I work in net zero buildings all day. That's all I do at this point. There's so much demand in the market right now. Developers are doing it. Towns are doing it. Um, universities are doing it. So, you know, this, this is, a, a, it seems like a new thing, but it's, it's really catching fire right now. Um, and it, there's a lot of reasons why it does, you know, because it, it makes sense financially. Uh, it's the right thing to do for climate. You know, so it's, a, it's overall uh, the smart choice at this point. It makes a lot of sense. So I'm happy to share with you some overview of what is net zero. How do we define that? What are the precedents that are out there? Uh, one case study kind of in detail, just so you can get a real feel for what is a net zero building. And then, and then happy to answer any questions to help you think about this topic. So share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Okay, great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so first off, just wanna to touch on, when we say net zero, what, what are we actually talking about? Uh, so there's three legs to the stool for net zero energy. The first leg of the stool is energy efficiency. So you have to have an energy efficient building to start with. If you have a big energy hog of a building, it's gonna make things very difficult and expensive and not really meet the intent of net zero. Uh, then you need to electrify the heating and domestic hot water sources for the building. Typically that's done with heat pumps. So you're moving away from using fossil fuels. And then the final step is to procure the on and offsite renewable energy to get to zero on an annual basis. So essentially on a, uh, throughout a year, the building uses a certain amount of energy, and then you either produce on site or buy from off site enough energy to offset that on a one to one basis, uh, and you get to zero. So, as I mentioned earlier, there's a huge growth in the market of net zero buildings. Uh, just in Massachusetts alone, there is approaching 7 million square feet of buildings either built or in construction or late stages of design all throughout the state. And they cover a wide range of building types. You can see some of the examples here. This is just a sample, but assembly buildings, education buildings, residential, affordable housing, even science and technology buildings and offices. <clears throat> now, let's just talk a little bit about energy efficiency. Um, so there's a couple of key strategies that, that one does typically for a net zero building or a net zero ready building to improve the envelope. And it's typically not very uh, aggressive or you know, game changing in terms of how you actually design and build a building. It can be as simple as improving the window U value. So maybe you go from a double glazed window to a triple glazed window, but the building can still be beautiful and daylit. It's, it's not like you have to build a refrigerator to live in. Um, Another key element is ventilation energy recovery. It's a huge driver of building energy consumption. And so if you can go from a conventional heat recovery system to a more efficient one, you not only can save energy, but you can also uh, eliminate or greatly eliminate your heating demand in wintertime. You can recover so much energy from that exhaust air before it leaves the building that some systems you don't even need to add any more heat to the air as it comes into the space. Just recovering that energy gets it warm enough in the winter to bring it into the space as fresh ventilation air without adding any heat. And so you can achieve goals like a 50% heating load reduction compared to a conventional code minimum design. And that's a game changer in terms of moving towards net zero cost effectively. So that leads you to the opportunity of the second leg of the stool to move away from burning fossil fuels. Now, why do we talk about electricity for net zero buildings and green buildings? Why is electricity better than fossil fuels? Well, if you look at the uh, heat pump running on the grid in Massachusetts today, a heat pump is a very efficient piece of equipment and it runs in, on electricity. And if you compare the emissions of that heat pump when you account for all of the power plants on the grid and all the energy sources on the electric grid, you're actually re resulting in half of the emissions that you would have had if you were burning gas. 
So right off the bat, just using heat pumps, you're cutting your emissions in half. <clears throat> now, as the grid gets cleaner, which is now required by law in Massachusetts, then running those heat pumps gets cleaner and cleaner over time. And you can buy renewable energy right off, off the bat, right up front, and be carbon neutral on day one. You don't even have to wait for the grid to get cleaner. So a couple of different technologies are available for heat pumps. There's ground source heat pumps. That's very common for municipal buildings because there are long-term investments and geothermal is very efficient and lasts for the life of the building. And then there's also air source, which is a nice option uh, in terms of buildings that are maybe smaller or lower load or uh, maybe more constrained in terms of the site area. And those two technologies are basically pulling heat out of the air. So they are not an electric resistance toaster oven heating your building. A toaster oven, you put one unit of electricity in and you get one unit of heat generated. A heat pump is actually a, a means of just moving heat from one place to another. So you're not generating heat like a toaster, you're just moving the heat from either in the ground, like a ground source system into the building in the wintertime, or an air source system, you're actually pulling heat out of the air, yes, even even freezing cold winter air, you can pull heat out of that air and you can put it into your building. And you can get one unit of energy in equals three units of heat, useful heat put into your building. So it's, that's part of why it's so efficient and so low carbon. Now, traditionally a, a poor building with a bad envelope and bad energy recovery would use a huge amount of heat pumps to be able to heat that building because the peak heating demand is so high, you'd have to put a huge amount of equipment on the building. And that's what I was talking about before, is if you can improve the envelope and improve the heat recovery, ventilation, and other mechanical systems, you can get that load down so low that you need very few heat pumps to do the job. And that's what it makes uh, net zero cost effective, is finding that, that synergy, that hybrid of different strategies that come together as a whole solution. And the other nice thing about that is people sometimes worry, oh, well, can the grid handle making buildings all electric? Well, if you do it in this integrated way and you bring all these smart strategies together, your peak electric demand is not driven by those heat pumps heating your building. Normal buildings, you think about like summertime, you hear about California having brownouts, right? Because of the peak demand. Well, that's always happening in summer when the peak cooling demand is happening and those, all those cooling systems are running at the same time. Well, a net zero building not only leaves that peak in the summer and doesn't shift it to winter, but it also reduces that peak compared to a conventional building. So really efficient net zero buildings that are all electric actually have less electric demand on the grid than a conventional building. Now, it is okay to use some fossil fuels. You know, they're a good source of backup for backup power. I mean, our, our office does a lot of labs and hospitals and they have critical loads. You have to have an extra backup fuel source. That's okay. The idea is it just doesn't run unless you need it for an emergency. All right, so we've made our building net zero ready. Now we need to get our renewable energy. And as I mentioned before, you can do some of the renewables on site. You can do some of it off site. It's very flexible when you're defining a net zero building. Where can you get that renewable energy? There's a lot of different options. I understand you have a large scale uh, solar array in town. And so that could be a, one of your sources to power net zero buildings that are municipal buildings. So with that overview of what is a net zero building, I wanna go back to the fact that this is not only, you know, makes so much sense at this point, but the codes and regulations are moving in this direction too. So if you wanna be out ahead, it, there's the, the clock is basically ticking to make the right investment in new buildings. There's codes, kind of a patchwork of different codes all throughout the country, but the West Coast and the East Coast are really leading the charge. Massachusetts has the stretch code, but that's not a net zero code yet. The climate bill that just passed though, mandates that a net zero stretch code be developed and made available for towns to opt into. So by the end of 2021 or mid 2022, timeline is a little bit uh, in dispute at this point, but it has to be before the end of 2022. There will be an updated stretch code that all towns that currently use the stretch code will be using no matter what. That'll be a more efficient stretch code. And then on top of that, there'll be an option for towns to opt into to go to a net zero standard. And that would actually not just be for municipal buildings, that would be for any 
uh, large scale buildings that are built in the town, as well as residential um, potentially, but primarily they're focusing on, on commercial buildings. Um, so that basically any building that's currently covered by stretch code and potentially even some of the smaller ones would then be expected to meet a net zero standard under that, under that code. Now I mentioned the climate bill, that's the climate bill that is mandating that net zero code be made available. These are all of the towns that signed on to a support letter to say to the legislators, yes, we want the option to have a net zero code. Net zero is important to meeting our climate goals as a town. We, we need this as a tool. We're limited by the current rules and regulations. We need something that we can adopt to drive to carbon neutral. So we expect that many of these towns will be early adopters once the code becomes available. Now, there are some other tools that some cities and towns are using to move towards carbon neutral. So for example, zoning. Somerville has enacted a net zero zoning for large portions of the city, as well as large projects. Boston, we're currently working for Boston to develop a carbon neutral zoning standard that all new buildings will have to be carbon neutral when they're built starting in likely 2022, and Cambridge is headed in a similar direction. And then as you probably are aware, there's a number of towns working on different legal options for how to ban natural gas. Now, Boston is also moving towards uh, a standard where all existing buildings have to be carbon neutral over time. And so even old existing buildings are gonna have to make upgrades to move to carbon neutral by 2050 in the city of Boston. Now, this all comes together and is all enforceable and has makes sense for legislation because net zero is cost effective if you do it right. So part of uh, the study that supported the passage of the bill was where I mentioned before that 7 million square feet of net zero buildings throughout the state, they were surveyed and, and uh, roughly half of the respondents had done a comparison between a conventional code minimum building and a net zero building that they were actually was their basis of design for the project. And in that comparison of a conventional versus net zero, 85% said that it costs less than 1% premium but for just the construction cost. And then of course you get this operating savings to pay that 1% back very quickly. So that's really amazing to see all of these different building types coming in at less than 1%. And many more that were maybe over 1% were marginally above the 1% mark. So you think about all the things you spend 1% on on a project, you know, is carbon neutral one of those, is net zero one of those key things? So again, to give you a little bit more tangible sense of what is net zero building, we've been talking about all these kind of ideas and concepts, but let's talk about a real building that's built and operating since 2016. Uh, this is a building that we designed. It's at Bristol Community College in Fall River, Massachusetts. It's a DCAM project, state funded project. So similar to a municipal building in a lot of ways. It's a 50,000 square foot medical, dental, biology and science teaching lab building. So being a laboratory building, it's actually one of the more difficult buildings to achieve net zero with. You can see they serve the community with their dental program, nursing arts and their chemistry and biology programs up in the upper second floor. And what's great about this case study is the project did not start as a net zero building. It started about nine years ago and its initial part of getting its approval and funding from the state was just a simple basis of design. It was lead silver. It, was had, it had gas combustion boilers. It was not hyper efficient. It was you know a good high performance building. And that's what was then approved and funded by the state, which took over a year to get that funding in place. And when it came back to life, the college had committed to achieving carbon neutral by 2050. So the other really great thing was they were entering into a power purchase agreement, which you're familiar with, to build a solar array on the parking lot right next to where our new building is gonna be built. So we did an energy model of the building and we said, oh, okay, we've got this normal high performance building probably pretty good performance overall in terms of meeting net zero. And so our energy model showed that unfortunately, this new code compliant lead silver building was gonna use half of that entire 3.2 megawatt array and 120 homes worth of natural gas. So to me, when we realized this high performance 
suddenly meant nothing to me anymore. It clearly was not a net zero ready and not a carbon neutral ready building. And so the question was, how do we do better? So back in you know 2014, when we were working on this design, particularly for a lab, that was not a simple answer, right? It wasn't a school, schools are easy, libraries are easy, lab buildings are a little bit harder. So we had to come up with a, a new set of strategies, but strangely enough, they were actually pretty similar to what you would do on any net zero building. So really good energy recovery for ventilation air, uh, really efficient mechanical systems, a nice airtight, well-insulated envelope. And in this case, we used a ground store system because again, it's a lab building. It has pretty uh, high loads overall, even with a net zero design. So geothermal was a good fit. Could have also used air source. And ultimately we cut 70% of the energy out of the building. So a code compliant building on the left and then 70% savings on the right for net zero energy. The real question was, what did it cost to build? So the project had started, proved and funded as a traditional high performance building. And the state said, no way are you gonna go change the design and do net zero. There's no way we can afford that. We said, just give us a shot. We'll design both designs. We'll get the cost estimate from the independent cost estimator. And if it comes in on budget, we will, we think we should go the net zero solution. And it actually came in less than 1% premium. It was a $275,000 increase overall, uh, which was less than 1% of the overall construction budget. And then if you look at the, the net present savings of the building over its life cycle, it's, uh, it's over $4 million between the building and the solar PPA, PA combined. And then operating savings is over $230,000 a year. So for that community college, that's, hold on just uh, one sec. Sorry about the background noise here. Sorry about that. Um, so it's uh, equivalent of 50 students tuition per year. So this is all well and good that it's an environmental sustainable building, but this really directly impacts their bottom line, how they can serve the community and do their educational programming more cost effectively. So as I mentioned, we cut a huge amount of energy out of the building. We've been monitoring it ever since and it has performed as intended. It's actually energy positive. Um, and just to show one other quick example of how this translates to municipal buildings, uh, I happen to live in Belmont and you know, with my background, I was involved as an advisor sort of informally through the Belmont Middle and High School. It's a uh, over 400,000 square foot high school and middle school, huge, huge building. Um, and we were able to prove that it was actually cash flow positive to do net zero. I know that sounds like, how's that possible, right? You know, there's certain premiums you're gonna pay. It is a geothermal heated and cooled building so that there is some investment there. But for municipal buildings, typically you're taking out a bond, right? You're funding it via bond. And so all you actually see in terms of, in terms of monetary impact to the town is there's cash flow to pay back the bond and there's cash flow to operate the building. And so what you see on the left are the additional costs of the additional bond payments for the geothermal system and to pay for the rooftop solar array. And so there was an additional, you know, payment operating costs there in terms of the higher bond payments. And then on the right, we see the operating savings of the geothermal, of the rooftop solar and the alternative energy credits. And it, it actually means that on a month by month, quarter by quarter, year by year basis, it is less expensive to have a net zero building from day one all the way through its lifespan and ended up being over a $5 million net present savings for the town. And that's, those are the dollars that the taxpayers see. So you've, I think, experienced this with your own projects that these are great investments, the solar array in your town, uh, your geothermal uh, municipal building that you already have. So I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but it's nice to kind of crystallize that in your mind to say, oh, you mean as a taxpayer, I'm literally gonna have less tax taxes that we have to pay for this net zero building, why, would, why wouldn't we do a net zero building? So we've had experience as a 
Natasha mentioned working on millions of square feet of net zero projects all around the state um, and consistently able to achieve it for less than 1% and having this positive cash flow approach to these projects. So that's, uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Hank, do you want to uh, raise up. any questions or comments? Or Michael, did were you were you going to say something also about what the? Topic? I am going to wait uh, for okay. the questions because I we, what we really wanted to encourage and you know was a discussion here and questions from the committee that Jacob can answer and I will just have a few minutes at the at the very end. So I think that I I just would add a quick comment and you know as I said before I think as a, as a committee we've strived pretty hard to do uh, towards the net zero and as efficient as we can. I think the one thing that I put on the table um, from the committee and, and, and also invite any of the committee members to either add to the comment or refute it whatever way you want to look at it but I think the committee has come across a couple of situations recently where I think it makes a lot of sense though the design of the, the design of the buildings there, we need to spend some additional funds that have to come out of the contingency, but as a responsible committee and what we're designated to do, we've hesitated uh, to spend under the guise of, of the responsibility of the project. So I think it would be really good to find and voice in this group is how can we get the town to get closer to establishing um, a policy, how can this town begin to put in place a more formal expectation um, on the buildings? And I think we could, is it fair um, committee to basically take a look at the Jack Cogswell building, which we've been pushing very, very hard. Um, there is some expenditure that that's, I would say it's not just, you know, a couple dollars to put solar array on the Jack Cogswell, but would add tremendous feedback into the grid um, we would probably, uh, and I know there's some financial considerations. I know there's some other considerations, but overall, substantial, uh, you know, generation of electricity. And if we go so far as think about moving to electrical vehicles, we could actually be in place to, I know this is not net zero, so to speak, but it's, but it's really putting renewable energy back in the grid. So back to the net zero, I think we have to think about as a town, to put in some policies. So as a group like the Permanent Public Building Committee and building very important buildings here, have some guidelines to work with versus us doing cutting edge stuff inside the contingencies, uh, if that makes sense or not. I don't know if any of the committee wants to comment on that. Jacob, did you have a Yeah, I just want to mention that Belmont went through that same exact thought process. You know, it's it's really hard for a building committee to de grapple with these, you know, all of these politics and issues on a pro every single project basis. And so after we proved the financial case on the high school project, uh, it went to, um, I think it went to town meeting, but to basically say, look, the policy should be net zero is the target for all municipal projects going forward. So that was, that was a, I think, a good direction for Belmont. Any, Erwin, your hands up. Yeah, I, I think that uh, makes a lot of sense to get the town to basically establish a goal and a path forward. I think as an interim, as we have projects that come along, what impressed me about the presentation was the minimal uh, additional costs to kind of go to that design. And the payback seems pretty remarkable. So I think as I think as a bridge until there is a town policy, we, we should continue to push on a project by project basis as much as we can. Because it's not only about a few years down the road, it's I think it's the vision of the future that uh, we we really should be thinking about in in everything the town does that expends energy. Um, Hank, is it okay? I'll just go through the questions. I can see the panel. Um, I know George has one and Karis, Karis you have a, uh, you wanna go with yours and then George, those are the two hands I see. 
Sure. Um, I guess I have two questions. Um, so my first question would be, I've been with the town for a while on the, um, the maintenance of uh, building side. And, um, you know, we, there was a really strong push to move all of our buildings from oil to natural gas, probably about 10, you know, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, so I guess one of the questions is we haven't finished that. Is there still recommendations that we should be doing that? Or is it sort of natural gas is no longer the, um, what we thought it was in terms of um, being less of a carbon hog and therefore we should be looking more at electric? Yeah, unfortunately gas is not much of an improvement in terms of carbon compared to oil. It is an improvement typically in terms of energy cost. So there are probably still cases in your, in your municipal buildings where it may make sense to make that switch from oil to gas, just as a financial decision. Um, but then of course you are investing in something that you want to get the savings from. So you, you expect it to live for a certain amount of time and be operating. So you wanna look very strategically at, well, okay, which buildings need more of a full upgrade and could therefore transition to heat pump based technology and which buildings need just a bare minimum kind of this boiler's failing, we need to replace it. Let's use a gas boiler because it's gonna be cost saving. So, I mean, we've grappled with that on many existing buildings. Um, and so it's really on a case by case basis that you'd make a decision, but it's worth, if you're about to replace a boiler, at least check and say, well, what would it take to do an electric solution? And often it, it may not be viable with that kind of minimal boiler replacement fund maybe a bigger project or renovation that would trigger switching to heat pumps. So they just have to look at each job. Um, and then my follow, or the separate question is just on the maintenance cost aspect of it. So we know that the constructor, you have documentation about the construction costs and how they've come in. What are the maintenance cost differences between um, a traditional building or a traditional leads building and a um, net zero building? Yeah. So when you do new construction, any new building is going to be much more advanced than a lot of the older buildings in town. And so inherently a new building is going to have a higher maintenance cost because you need more technical staff for managing the building automation system, all the controls, right? And even just code minimum now requires all kinds of advanced control logic to save energy for just the code, the standard code. Um, so the, some of the key differences that you see between a net zero building and a conventional building might be a better envelope which doesn't really require more maintenance. Hopefully a better envelope actually requires less maintenance, particularly if you do a really good job commissioning it and air sealing and water sealing. Now, some of the mechanical systems can be a little more expensive to maintain like heat pump. If you just compare a boiler versus a heat pump, heat pump costs more to maintain. So you have to look at everything holistically. If you do like a one-to-one, -one, you might make the wrong decision at a, you might make the right decision at a small scale of that two pieces of equipment comparison but you might make the wrong decision in the overall scale. And that's why whenever we do a net zero building, we look at it holistically, right? There's a lot of things that are saving cost. There's a lot of things that are adding a little bit of cost. And there's some things that maybe add a lot of cost, like geothermal, right? Big dollar signs. But as a whole, that's how you can get it down to an optimal solution. And that's first cost, but also the same mentality applies to maintenance cost. Yeah, there might be pieces that are going to take more maintenance to operate, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket when you look at that whole operating cost category. All set? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, George? I think um, I've got a couple of comments. One is uh, I think that it's certainly not the responsibility of the building committee to establish what the ground rules are for future development of buildings. But on the other hand, I don't see that coming out of anywhere else in town. And I think that uh, at the very least, we ought to go on record with all of the powers that be that we think that that approach is something that should be included in every project that is upcoming within uh, after this year. I, I really believe that if we don't say that up front, uh, we also ought to be able to tell them what the implications of that might be uh, but uh, but I think it's important that someone take the lead in pushing this, because if we wait until we have a project, then it's probably going to be too late and we'll end up, you know, doing the same sort of thing we've done in the past. Uh, so I, I do think the leadership can, some leadership can come from the building committee. 
I think we're a very, very highly respected group of people from the town's perspective. Uh, certainly town meeting and select board and FinCom uh, believe that we are. And I think this is something that we ought to put on our plate to at least push from our end. Uh, that's one kind of uh, soapbox comment. Uh, the second thing is that I think it's going to be hard to uh, rehab uh, buildings. Uh, and see, we've done a very good job of building buildings over the last 15 years in this town. And so we have a lot of buildings that, are, that aren't terribly old, uh, but they don't, then they don't have uh, uh, renewable energy uh, uses except for the except for the one that we did at the um, uh, uh, Public Services Administration building. Um, but other buildings, it's gonna be very hard to kind of rehab them. I guess my question um, uh, is, how, have you done any projects where you've actually uh, rehabbed a, a cooling system to make it uh, close to net zero or net zero? Have you taken a, a traditional building uh, like ones that we've designed and built, they're very efficient. You know, we've done it, uh, uh, trying to make them as efficient as possible in all the other respects, but we, we didn't in terms of uh, putting heat pumps in and things like that. Have you done any buildings like that where we could in fact um, change the, uh, uh, the building into net zero, an existing building? Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, the rarest net zero building is the building that's only 10 years old that was built to be running on fossil fuels, right? Because a, yeah. a new building can be net zero and a really old building that needs a big renovation can make that leap. But a new building that's efficient, but running on fossil fuels and maybe has some key missing elements, that's the hardest one because that's, you, you know, it doesn't make sense necessarily to re replace all those relatively new systems. So one of the key technologies that's recently come onto the market that is opening up that potential is air to water heat pumps. So, okay, let me back up. Typically, probably a lot of those buildings have boilers, right? Boiler makes hot water, hot water goes out to coils in the air handler and at the zones and wherever that hot water is needed for heating. And so where do you, how do you make a heat pump that can make that higher temperature hot water that you need and do it from a, you know, a source and put it in an, in an existing building. And so the, the new technology that's, that's really come to the fore over the past just few years is air to water heat pumps. So it grabs heat from the ambient air and it can put it into a hot water loop at reasonably warm temperatures that you can probably use in some of those buildings. Um, so that's, that's an exciting new development and that technology is evolving very quickly. So certainly within, you know, if you have a transition plan for those newer buildings over the next 10, 20, you know, sometime before 2050, ideally, you can just have a plan in place to say, look, as we need to replace those boilers, we look at air to water heat pumps. And you also can look at, at part load strategies where you can handle the peak with the boiler that exists, but you can handle maybe half that peak with air to water heat pumps limited only by the amount of electrical infrastructure in that building. And if you can handle half of the peak load, that means you can handle 95% of the annual heating energy because most of the time you're not running at peak, you're running down low. And, that, and those heat pumps can do all that work and then the boilers can just kick on for those extreme cold conditions. And so you know, without having to redo all your electrical infrastructure to handle this, this bigger equipment, um, you can you know, almost eliminate your carbon emissions. So this, there are ways that, that it can be done. It's just, you know, it's gonna take some time and some planning. I have one more quick question if I could. And, and that, is, that relates to personnel that is required to support uh, net zero buildings. Um, you know, typically in the past, we, we, we have um, uh, skilled workers that, that support the maintenance in these buildings. And I know over time, as we've developed more and more systems uh, to control things off-site, for example, uh, so that we can control a building heating system, and we have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, high-tech uh, features in these buildings, uh, we've had to hire uh, more sophisticated uh, individuals with better backgrounds uh, in that. What, what, what is your experience with regard to uh, what is required 
by the town to uh, hire people to maintain these buildings because we can build all these great buildings, but if they're not maintained properly or you don't have the right personnel to recognize issues and, and prevent problems from occurring, then, then you're, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's kind of, there's a spectrum, right, of how you address that issue from heavy outsourcing to heavy staff, you know, hiring. And if you, if you go too far to the heavy outsourcing end of things, you're in trouble because you don't even have the staff in town to know that there's a problem or who to call to solve it. You know, you need a certain level of experience to say, okay, I know what the problem is. I might need a BAS controls vendor to come in and make some adjustments to the programming. I might not be a specialist in, you know, editing the, the program that runs the building, but I can at least see, okay, there's an issue and, and that's the category it's in and that's how it needs to be addressed. So I think you need to find the right balance for your, your town and your buildings in that range uh, in terms of having that expertise in house. And then there's always going to be some even more specialized level that makes sense to outsource because it's just not consistent enough work in that in that realm within just the municipal buildings that you have. But I mean, I've seen that over and over again with with our projects. You know, we follow up for years afterwards, make sure things are working well, and you know, we see where they you know run into issues and where they're bringing in um, outside vendors, and and that's net zero or even just a normal building these days. There's there all of the technology is getting pretty advanced just across the board. Okay, that's an issue I think we as a town have a problem with as well that needs to be solved in the long term. Great, anything else, George? No, that's it for now. Great, okay. Hank, is there, I don't see any other hands up, Hank. Oh, Natasha. I have a quick question just in general. How do other towns, and maybe this is a Hank or Michael or maybe Jacob or anyone else, how do other town deal how do they deal with policy regarding townwide goals for environmental and sustainability, you know, goals for the entire town? I know, you know, the PPBC is one committee. I know now starting on the planning board, you know, there's been a lot of interest in, um, you know, sustainable environmental zoning and things like that. So who, who in the town leads or, or creates a policy for what happens? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. Uh, I live in Concord. Um, the uh, town of Concord uh, started this discussion uh, back in 2015, 16. And there was uh, discussions similar to what we're having right now. Um, there was a group of uh, very committed citizens who got together and um, started that discussion and out of that grew an initial um, town warrant article to, um, well, initially it was becoming a green community and taking other initiatives. And, uh, and then the following year, after a year of discussion, um, the town decided that it was necessary not only to have a a climate action committee as an advising group, a formal advising group, but also a sustainability coordinator uh, within the town. And that sustainability coordinator currently um, looks broadly at the issues across all uh, other departments. And so the sustainability um, director um, reviews every single planning application, for instance, trying to meet the goals that, that were established um, in that, that town meeting. So um, there are, and there are other communities where the green communities um, be, is the central armature that provides that structure. And in, in some of those, they're just assistance looking just at energy, but, um, and I certainly uh, anyone visiting uh, the town of Concord website, type in sustainability. Um, those issues deal not only with new buildings, but they deal with um, the opportunities for putting renewable on your own residences, very similar to what 
um, the uh, Green Needham has done in terms of helping um, the private sector uh, move toward a more sustainable uh, future. And Lincoln and Lexington have, sim have had similar approaches. Likewise, um, I, Wellesley, I think, is moving in that direction as well. Uh, Stuart, could I? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Because this is essentially what I was planning to get to. Waiting for. <laughs> so when, when I was starting this process a couple of years ago, knowing that net zero was possible um, and thinking about how we should do it, and about a year ago, over a year, Natasha and I spoke, I determined that I wanted to come to this committee first because every town is different. And there are a lot of things that you can do in one town that don't work in another because the towns just and the cities work differently. They have different legal structures. They have different political structures, just different environments. Um, and so here in Needham, I, I looked at this committee as the go-to committee and, you know, Hank said it, uh, I'm sorry, uh, George said it for me, I kind of figured he would, that everyone looks to when you're asking, how can we do something well? It comes to building construction. So that's why I wanted to come to this group. I think when I look, the, the select board sets a lot of policies in this community. So I would like them to be able, they would be the ones I think in the first instance that could go through the stakeholder process that says, is this a goal that we as the select board wanna set for our buildings? All right. So they could be the lead on that. And I also, it's important that the user agencies who are involved in building projects look at it and speaking as a member of a school committee and you know, your frequent flyer here on the PPBC, it's something, um, a conversation I've had and I'm having with the school committee. I mean, my responsibility, I see my responsibility as a school committee member to prepare the next generation of citizens. And if I'm preparing them for a world that I've screwed up because we're not building buildings that are gonna be zero, you know, zero net carbon, then I'm not doing a very good job. So this is really important on a lot of levels. It's important to me as the chair of Green Needham because we wanna see this move forward. Important to me as a taxpayer because I see the financial benefits of doing it. And as a citizen, because I want us to move forward into an environment where we can really have a very thriving economy. I do wanna make the point, and I, you know, again, I, I almost feel it sometimes, you don't have to say this anymore, but I always do anyway. A lot of people still make the argument that doing this stuff is just about pain. It's not. Yes, we want to avoid the worst uh, impacts of climate change, but we are also unleashing a zero carbon economy. And in this part of the country, especially, we've already seen the benefits in uh, the renewable energy sector and all the jobs we create here. So this, there's a lot of reasons to do this. And so here, this is why I'm starting here. This is why I invited the planning board, the school committee and the select board to listen to this presentation. We Green Needham would certainly like to go to the select board and we'd love to do it with the support of the PPBC to say, this is a policy, this is a goal that you can put in place. And the people, I would hope we get to the point where the people they will turn to, which is this committee would say, yes, we believe this makes financial sense. It makes environmental sense. It just makes good sense for this community. Um, I will just add parenthetically that we are also starting the conversation about a climate action plan. If you're going to have a climate action plan to reach the state mandated 2050 goals, which we're all going to have to do, this would be an element of a plan like that. Um, I would certainly like to have uh, residential builders hear about the benefits of doing this. We would like the planning board to be thinking about the net zero energy stretch code and the energy codes that are to come, because eventually there will be a net zero energy code. Uh, we might not adopt the early one, but it will happen. So that's kind of my, my answer of how we'd like to see this happen. I see this group as, as having an incredible voice, uh, you know, as George said, in stepping up and saying, yes, we can do this. And yes, we should do this. So that's what this presentation was in aid of, to have that conversation happen in this board. I think that that's absolutely right. I think this board has, has as I tried to say earlier, is that I think we'd like nothing more than to see us do the right thing. We've had to grapple with some uh, spending some money in some of these buildings to follow that code because we felt for long term it made a lot of sense. I think in general people would agree with it, but unfortunately with the financial responsibility and accountability we have in the projects, sometimes it goes out of the context and, and four corners, whatever you want to call it, but in terms of the scope of the project, it starts to stretch a little bit. I think we would like nothing more than to be given a, a policy out there that we can work within that we see as a responsible way of, of building these buildings as we go forward. Um, so I think this committee, and, and I would just ask again, 
if any other committee member uh, has any commentary, but as, as chair, I would say that we, uh, we would like nothing more than to support Green Needham and support a, a very viable discussion at the select board level um, as, as we believe there are ways to do these buildings. And there's many times where the architects and the design process, um, we talk about silver lead, lead um, I'm sorry, lead uh, engineering, everything else that we're doing, um, where I think we could go actually even further, um, but it does beg the question of how far can we go within the scope and what we've been asked to do within the context of building the building. I would just turn it over to any other uh, board member at this point. And, oh, Natasha, I see your hand is up, so I'll, I'll turn to you. But I would like any other commentary from the board after that. I just have a quick thing. So we're working on this project in Framingham for uh, Mass Bay Community College, Jacob and I. Um, and one of the things that I do wanna say is that we have been able to do this building, still keep everything in for net zero. At, it's, it's, a, it's a health science building and it's labs, but it's really, it's really a classroom building. So it, would, it wouldn't be any different than a lot of the schools that we're building here, you know, a little different, but it's not, it's not a lab building, it's not a functioning lab building. Um, and so um, one of the things that I wanna say is that we've been able to keep it down at between 500 and $530 a square foot. That includes a huge site cost that had nothing to do with the project. And we're still, during COVID, when all of the prices are, we have a CM on board, are going skyrocketing high right this second and everyone's freaking out. We're finding ways of, of doing alternates or deducts and things, but we're still keeping it net zero. So I just wanna say that even during the most dire times under a very strict DCAM rules, we're still being able to do it. So I, I, I mean, I think there's something to be said for, for, the, for, you know, for doing a 70,000 square foot building um, that is still net zero, even during a crisis like the pandemic. Right. Erwin? I just wanted to follow up on what you had just said, Stuart, as far, I always like to think, what are the next steps? Would it be a joint meeting with us and the Board of Selectmen where this is an agenda item? Because I'd hate to have this discussion, which has been very positive, kind of not lead to a, a concrete next step. So we can kind of keep this, these thoughts going and get something put out there that would be something we can follow as a policy rather than just keep talking about it. So would a joint meeting make sense? I, I think so. And if I may, I see in the audience, a couple select board members. May I ask the select board and put them on the spot in, in terms of this discussion? Marianne? Um. So I would just say that I am fully expecting to see this as one of the select board goals that gets adopted this year. Um, I had been speaking with Kate already about um, some work that we could do to establish a climate action plan for um, the town and what was gonna ha happen to do that. Um, I think this discussion has been an important one and I didn't hear the first 30 minutes. I missed it from another commitment tonight. Um, so I will have to go back and watch. I, I worry a little bit. I don't want to end up in a, establishing a one by each kind of an approach. And I do think it's going to be important for the town to step back and say, okay, if we're trying to get to carbon neutrality in that timeline, what are the various pieces that it's going to take to get there? Um, I know I've just come from uh, watching and working at the colleges. We've established our plan for getting to 20, 2040 to 2040 for our carbon neutrality plan. And um, a lot of that, frankly, involves building in flexibility over the next five years while we continue to green our electricity sources and um, really trying to understand what's gonna happen with battery technology because we think that's gonna lead to presumably some different choices um, in a relatively short-term future, but they're not there today um, that, that might uh, make some shifts in exactly the directions we choose. So I think the town needs to go through a similar process looking at all of our sources. And um, I do expect that's gonna be a priority for the select board. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, um, I just want to interject that there are several um, supporting pieces. George mentioned one of them, that you need people to operate these systems. So just wanting a 
in designing a system that has the upgraded uh, mechanical technology, one of the three stools that was mentioned, um, isn't the sole answer. Um, you have to support this in a broad in a broad sense with regard to, you know, how are these systems going to operate? I, I don't think we've achieved the kind of savings and the kind of expectations from the uh, ground source design at PSAP. I'm not sure exactly. PSAP was designed with a electrical capacity to overcome uh, deficiencies in the operation of the ground source heat pump system that's in place. And it operates with that electricity uh, backup as opposed to the heat pump system because we haven't pulled the maintenance on it. And, you know, maintenance and the ability uh, of controls and to understand and how we operate the controls of these systems, all of that has to be factored into a decision if you're going to move forward. And so I just caution that it's more than just um, envelope and mechanical systems that you have to incorporate if you're going to get to your goals here. Marianne? Sure, my apologies. Um, I, Steve, I think your point is right on the money and that's exactly why I said I, I certainly would worry if we were to get into a one by each kind of a solution. Um, and I erred, I think, when I spoke earlier because I do appreciate very much that um, the PVBC held this hearing tonight, that Green Needham's involved. I know that Natasha's here and also thinking from her perspective on the planning board because I do believe it's gonna take all of us working together to find the right plan for the town that we can implement successfully. So I'm grateful for your starting this work and it is definitely work that's gonna take all of us um, to, to do the right thing. Great. Mike? I have a quick question. Um, what's the reliability of these new systems? I know that um, Bristol's, now how long's Bristol been around and what's the overall reliability of that system? And, and, uh, and, and, and do you see uh, a lot of issues because it's all computerized or because it's changing, how's it working? Yeah, Bristol's been operational since 2016. Uh, it's been achieving the energy targets that it's what had set forth from the beginning very consistently every year. That just like any building, it's had issues um, that they've had to, you know, either fix or bring in an outside uh, technical consultant to work on. Um, one of those things was um, the, uh, the ground source heat pump chillers that connect, you know, from the ground and then make hot water and chill water into the building um, had some uh, firmware issues, like the actual like, kind of hard programming in the in the modules that was causing them to trip. And so they did a firmware upgrade and that resolved that issue. Uh, but we do have redundancy and backup in that building because it's a lab. It has, it's, you know, it can't stop functioning from a health and safety standpoint. So they haven't had any major issues that have been a problem there in, in that regard. Jacob, in general, these buildings that we're doing for community colleges, they have minimal maintenance budgets for their maintenance groups. So I think part of the, the thing that most of the engineers that are doing right now is trying to make them as easy as possible to, to um, maintain. Um, and that's something that, you know, as you, you have to go project by project. But I think, um, again, the client group isn't any different. You know, it, it's, not, it's not a big private college or university that has resources to, to do it. I think it's, it's, it's bare bones maintenance that, that have been trained. Um, do you agree, Jacob? I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's very similar. Um, and I think you know, you look at the the 
cost savings of the energy side from these efficiency upgrades. And that oftentimes can be leveraged if you you know look at it as one operating budget to afford some, some of these more experienced either staff on the payroll or you know outside consultants if you need them. Um, so you know if you, I, I agree that that new, any new building is going to cost more from a maintenance standpoint just because the, the code mandates a lot of more advanced features just as a starting point. And any building can run well or run poorly depending on how you maintain it. So that, that's a really critical issue across the board. Buildings often don't run as intended, whether they're at zero or code minimum. But I appreciate what Steve was saying, which is you can do all these things, but you need to make sure that you have the tra proper training or the proper um, maintenance or the building isn't going to work as intended and we're not going to have the support. So that all has to be taken into account. We can't just pretend like that's not part of the equation. I think he's right. I think, uh, go ahead, Hank. Um, I should mention that the MSBA is certainly thinking about this topic. And next Thursday, they have almost a day long um, Zoom uh, entitled Demystifying Net Zero Energy. I don't know, Jacob, if you're participating in that one too. But um, it, as we have seen with the uh, lead silver, um, they have both a carrot and a stick. And the carrot is probably going to be a net zero and additional reimbursement uh, on future projects. Uh, I think that would be coming. It certainly would be consistent with the state's policy toward net zero buildings. Um, so if you're interested, you can get that information from the MSBA website or email me and I'll, I'll forward you a link. I think, um, I don't see more hands up, but I, I am gonna put another plug in for the maintenance. I mean, it's, it's an absolute, important topic and we already see it as a committee it's been a topic that we have had discussions with numerous times simply because as Jacob said these buildings are more complex um, we've already seen evidence in uh, the last five years or so where we haven't maintained some buildings and we've had to go back and replace things um, that should have lasted a, a great deal longer these aren't easy issues uh, we're all facing financial uh, perspective. We have financial perspectives and the town just doesn't have a lot of stuff to put as resources, but it is something we have to grapple with. And I think um, if I can go so far as say as a committee, sometimes it's saddened to see some of these buildings the way that we're, we put forth and work beautifully. And then with the lack of maintenance, um, and I think the maintenance department has done a tremendous job with the resources they have. I think we, we have to bring some more resources to the puzzle, but so it seems that there's a very good level of discussion tonight that leads us to, um, if I can say Marianne, um, is, is to help us bring together the select board. If Michael's got the Needham, um, we as a PVC um, would welcome an opportunity to bring this all together um, and see the select board um, bring some of that uh, uh, leadership and the policy forward so we can start to do some of these good things. Is there any last comments, Hank, before I turn it back to you? Anybody else that has any questions, commentary? Okay, Hank, do you have any closing pieces to this? I, I, uh, I, I thank you for asking the question and I look forward to continuing the discussion. Great. And I think for everybody that's in the audience, everybody that's in the, in the meeting right now, um, you know, just another plug for the PVC. The PVC is an open forum, open meeting. Um, as we go through design processes, we encourage people to uh, participate, uh, to learn about these topics and uh, listen to the kinds of work that we do as we try to strive to make these buildings better. Um, and I also encourage everybody that's here, I hope they're here for this reason, is also to continue the movement into the select board, into the other boards, the planning boards. Um, it is going to take several of us to work together to make it happen. Um, so with that, I will bring to conclusion this part of the agenda and uh, appreciate everybody's uh, participation and certainly Jacob for, for putting the information together and Michael and, and Natasha for, for uh, that as well, for the efforts. 
All right. So thank you, everybody. The PVC, um, just stick for one more minute. Thank you. Good to meet thank everybody. You, everyone. Thank you again. Everybody sure is moving out. In terms of the PVC, um, the next meeting is the the 14th. Um, just quickly, Catherine and Steve, um, for everybody's benefit as usual, we've got the agenda. On the bottom of the agenda is the dates. We're going into the summer. We, you know, depending on how Ken and, and the public safety, that's the main project that we're contending with the demands. We need to keep the dates, but obviously if not enough stuff is going to be on the agenda or, or voting items, we will push. But Steve or, uh, is and Ken, relative to dates, sorry, Steve, relative to dates, are we okay with these dates? Is there any changes? And Catherine, too, is there anything uh, we need to discuss tonight relative to dates? I, I don't think there's any um, problem with the dates. Okay. And in terms of, of as everybody knows, the CDC has uh, relinquished the mask uh, topic and people getting together. Now, we under are under state law, I believe, or mandate. So we're not as open as the rest of the country. Um, if we want to discuss this tonight, we can. But my sense is from a PVC getting back together face to face, I wouldn't see till August or September. I think it's wise unless the town, Kate, and, and the select board require us to meet. I think the Zoom has worked. People have been able to get into these meetings. Um, I'd rather be safe than sorry, because I'm not as convinced. Everybody is entitled to their opinion, so I'm, I, I will leave to everybody else. But I, I'd rather be safe and just run through the summer in a Zoom capacity. Um, but if people have a different opinion to that, um, we, can, we can discuss that. Richard? Well, I'm just sure I would just uh, note too that a lot of this uh, will, really will be driven by the state authorization or rescission thereof, which allows for Zoom meetings. Remember, this is an exception to the open meeting law that is allowing for this format. Um, and uh, we'll have to watch very carefully to see what the governor does about this. This was part of the original uh, emergency order, as I recall, uh, back in March of 2020. So um, I, I don't know whether um, provision for Zoom meetings is affected at all by uh, the governor's announcement today. I, I, I didn't hear anything about that. I haven't seen the, the actual uh, um, uh, uh, instructions or actually the, the actual uh, a decision by the governor, but the bottom line is we'll have to watch that because that will certainly, uh, that will drive home the discussion. If, if the Zoom platform is rescinded at some point, and it will be at some point, but we don't know when, uh, that will that will end the discussion. We will be meeting uh, in person. So. Okay. Well, cer certainly, uh, the, the order still exists until June 15th. Um, right. And so our next meeting in June won't be affected. We can still officially right. use the Zoom process. Uh, but I think the town really should answer that question because as I interpret what the governor said today, it's really up to the towns to decide what they want to do. And they could impose uh, continued strict requirements if they felt that was necessary. So I think that's something we should, you know, go to Kate and the select board and let them take the lead on. But certainly we're okay right through the middle of June because the uh, executive order still continues until then. So Steve, can I ask you to touch base with Kate on that and let us know if there is, I mean, obviously we'll wait for the governor stuff, but uh, it, it seems we should take Kate's leader, take, take her. Yeah, um, as I said earlier, um, it may, all people may not have been on. Um, Kate has a, uh, a department managers meeting on Friday, which the purpose of which is to discuss the uh, the process, and okay. that's one one of the items in the process. So I will get back to you uh, after that meeting. Okay, great. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover. Any other topics? Commentary. Okay, great. Well, until the next meeting. Thanks, everybody.
Have a great week. Go Thank Bruins. Go Bruins. Go Bruins. There you go. <laughs> Thanks all. Have a good, good night, night, all. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.